Let me share with you some reflections on the meaning of Pentecost and some understanding of the living word of God given to us today. It's the Feast of Pentecost. Pentecost, that word, comes from a Greek word meaning 50th. And the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, our first reading today from chapter 2, tells us Jerusalem was crowded with people. The reason being, this was one of the three great feasts of the Jewish people. You have Passover, this is Shavuot, which is also called the Feast of Weeks, seven times seven, 49. On the 50th day, you have Shavuot, a great feast for the Jewish people. That's why it was crowded. The third one is called Sukkoth, and that appears in the fall. And on these three occasions, the population of Jerusalem would grow immensely for they would all come to celebrate these great festivals. The second thing by way of background is, I'd like to talk about exegesis for a few moments and then go to the teaching of these readings. They speak and everybody hears in their own language. There's a huge amount of commentary written about that. Let me tell you what I think it means. It means when you hear the Word of God, the inspired, living Word of God, it speaks to you wherever you are in your life. You will hear the Word of God in your own language. You're young, you're elderly, you're married, you're divorced, you don't go to church, you're gay, you belong to that community, whatever your color, whatever your station in life, wherever you find yourself in life, the Word of God spoken in the power of the Holy Spirit, you will hear in your own language. I've been reading these scriptures all my life, and yet when I read it now, it speaks to me quite differently than it did 25 or 30 years ago. The Word of God speaks to me in the place in which I find myself. The Word of God is alive. The second point out of these readings is when Jesus comes to his disciples, it's not the twelve. In John's Gospel, The twelve, I can only find one mention of the twelve in the Gospel of John, and that's in chapter 6. You know, the other three Gospels name the twelve, but not John. John gives very little attention to the twelve. It's a group of disciples, and he greets them with, Peace be with you. Now, this is a salutation that is used today, shalom, Alechim, peace be with you. You will hear it if you go to Jerusalem today. All the people will greet one another in this way. Um, So Jesus, however, if you read the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus speaking at the Last Supper to his disciples, he will say, my peace is my farewell to you but I do not give peace to you as the world gives it. I give you a peace which the world cannot give you. I give you a peace of soul, something deep inside yourself. I give you a harmony inside yourself that the world cannot give. Money can't buy, prestige, success won't give you the peace that I can give you. My peace I give you, do not be anxious. Do not be distressed, he says. I give you my peace. And now, in this Pentecost uh, remembrance, Jesus comes to his disciples and he greets them with peace be with you, a peace which the world cannot give. 
It's a peace of soul. And unless we have the peace inside of us, we will not have peace in our families, in our communities, in our churches, in our country. The peace given to us by Jesus Christ. So let me talk a little bit about the teaching of this. In the fourth chapter of the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, in verse 16 and 17, there's a story that you will remember. Cain murders his brother Abel, and he appears before the Lord, and he is banished from his land. He has to go away from the Lord now, and he goes to what's called the land of Nod. Well, that's not a territory in biblical language. That's the place of nomads. He will wander now. The land of Nod is east of Eden. He goes to a place east of Eden. John Steinbeck took this and titled what he called his greatest book. I know that he got a Pulitzer for Grapes of Wrath, but he himself said East of Eden was his greatest work. And it was very personal to John Steinbeck because he had two sons. And the story of East of Eden, of course, is about two generations of a family, the Task family, and each generation successively two sons. And the complications and the sins of a family. It's a story of the sins of a family. The conflict, the rivalry, uh, the upheaval inside a family passed on from one generation to the next. East of Eden. It's not only in a family. It's in a community. It's the struggles in a church, the struggles in a land. It's the tension, the rivalry, the combat, the violence. And somewhere in our journey of life, we have lived east of Eden. It's a familiar story. It's a story that belongs to every family. Sin is not breaking a commandment. Sin is breaking or wounding a relationship. Jealousy, greed, infidelity, violence, injustice. They look like commandments, but they're breaking relationships. Jealousy, envy, gossip, judgment, divisions. Look at your own family. Consider for a moment if we're not east of Eden. We are told when a family gathers, or we are gathering these days, don't discuss religion or politics. Well, why not? Because we're so arrogant, we're so overwhelming, we're so insistent, we're so demanding of having the last word, we're east of Eden. This is where division happens. We don't listen. We don't understand, we're not patient. And when that happens, in a family, in a church, in a community, in a country, we are east of Eden. So what happens when we look deep inside ourselves and we discover this division, this conflict inside ourselves? and we pray, and we listen to God's Word, 
and we seek peace. We seek peace inside of ourselves. For many of us, uh, it will mean some ritual of reconciliation. And Jesus says, whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven. That was used in the Council of Trent in 1545 to speak to the sacrament of reconciliation. But there are many ways in which we should seek reconciliation. Peace of soul, peace inside. Now we all have confessional moments. We all have stories about going to confession. It's not a place of judgment, it's not a tribunal of penance. It's a place of reconciliation. I have my own stories about, about confession. I belong to the world, I belong to people. In all my years traveling with Cardinal Manning, we had, we had a, a practice that we went to Rome very frequently. We always go to confession when we went to Rome. Somehow it made the journey holy. On one occasion, I went up to St. Peter's Basilica, went to confession there. I could tell the priest was a Dominican. He had black and white robes. It was a holy year. And I began my confession saying, bless me, our Father, I'm a priest, I want to make my confession. I don't remember exactly what I said, but I hadn't robbed any banks or killed anybody. Some major things. Whatever I confessed, he said, what special penance are you doing for the holy year? And I said, I'm not doing any penance. <laughs> well, he, he upbraided me. He, he gave me a lecture. And for my penance, he gave me three times the Stations of the Cross and two rosaries. Well, when I came out of that confession, I was not at peace. I was worse after the confession than I was before. And, and I remember the next day, I was having lunch with Cardinal Manning and some important official at the Vatican. And I said to this archbishop, you know that priest, that fellow down at St. Peter's, that Dominican, he's got to go because he, he's going to hurt people. It's a place of reconciliation, it's a place of peace. It's a place where somehow I will feel the peace of Christ. You know, when I hear confessions here at Holy Family, when the children come, coming to Christmas or Easter or preparing for First Communion, they sit here in the sanctuary and they sit opposite to me, talk to me. Say, what would you like to ask Jesus to forgive you? And Typically, a kid will say, I was fighting with my brother. Oh, wow. Do you have, how old is your brother? Twelve. Oh, do you have a big brother? That's not easy. No, it's not easy. Okay. Now, you're going to try to be nice to your brother. Easter is coming. It's Christmas. Oh, okay, fine. Then I say to this little person, I bet you've got a lot of friends. And invariably, the child says, I do. And I'd say, well, I just know because there's something really special about you. I want that child to go away saying, I'm good. Because when I was a child and I went to confession, I went away thinking, I'm not good enough. And the greatest reconciliation we have in our needs is to be reconciled with our goodness. You, my friend, have no idea how good you are. The sacrament is meant to reconcile you with your goodness. Years ago, when in the seminary we did the penance tract, it said you confess your sins, secundum specium et numerum, according to species and number, details. How many times exactly? It was always embarrassing sometimes to get into too many details. In the renewal understanding of the sacrament, it's not so much the confession, it's to experience the reconciling love of God to tell me that I'm a blessed person, 
to tell me I'm a son or a daughter of God, to give me confidence, to heal the wound which is inside of me, the wound I have discovered, the conflict, the judgment I have made, the greed I have exercised, the demand I have made to have the last word, a division that I caused, whatever it is, I need to be healed. It's not just forgiveness, it's healing. And in that healing, I will experience the peace of Christ. That's the grace of the sacrament. Peace be with you. I hear the voice of Jesus saying, with all your faults and with all your failings, I bless you, I forgive you, be healed. Go now in the peace of Christ. Wow. We need to pray about that. So I'd like to pause for a moment of prayer now. Close your eyes. Put down your cup of coffee. And be alone. Be alone for a moment. Be silent now. Look deep inside yourself. Listen to yourself. Listen to yourself. Breathe in. Breathe in the presence of God. Be conscious of the presence of God. Lord, you know my weakness. You know my brokenness. You know the conflicts which I carry inside myself and which I have transferred to others. You know my moments of selfishness, my controlling, my demanding spirit. You know my inner self, and yet, yet you love me. Let me hear your voice, a voice of forgiveness, a voice of healing, a voice of peace. You see my heart. You see my sincerity. You understand my faith. You love me in all my humanity, in all my brokenness. I am called, I am chosen, and I am blessed. Renew my faith as you call me into a discipleship of love and a place of peace. No more judgments about people, no more division, no more demanding. In your name, Jesus, I will be a servant, a listening person, a healing person, a gifting, generous person, all in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.